This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. Tonight's show begins in local schools. Jessica Najunez reports on Berkeley High School's new addition to its attendance program. But first, we hear from undocumented undergrads who speak out about their status, their stigma, and their dreams. Rachel Whitty reports. I'm here to support my family and community, not just for myself. So when I succeed, so do they. When I triumph, they share the glory. They call it undocumentation a day-long symposium at UC Berkeley highlighting the plight of undocumented communities. I had no idea I was undocumented until I started applying to, to college, so it was definitely, I, I'm, I think to, to understand that you're undocumented at that age, it's an identity crisis, you know? Here on campus, about 200 undocumented students pursue their futures, even as their pasts prevent them from enjoying opportunities afforded to other students. It was really, um, our, our burden. It was just really hard to actually go to college because I needed to get a part-time job. Enter the California Dream Act, legislation enacted in 2011 that promised students like Aguilar a chance to receive private financial aid to attend state universities. Yet for many students, the legislation fell short of the dream. I only received um, enough to pay for tuition, so I had to worry about paying for rent, paying for food, paying for all those things, all my other expenses, which was a bit hard. In January, a new bill was enacted, opening the door to state education grants for undocumented students, as much as $12,000 in financial aid. Which is welcome news to these Mission High School seniors attending a workshop on the DREAM Act legislation, drawn by the hope that they will have opportunities their parents never had. It really benefits not just undocumented students, but also society as a whole, because they're able, they're going to now be able to contribute to society more legally. Students have until March 2nd to apply for the new program. The financial assistance will go into effect in the next academic year. For Krishna Avila, the monetary aid is a welcome start, but he is dreaming bigger. We're at a new day today where I think undocumented youth should be um, aware of like the power that we have. For CNS News, this is Rachel Witte. Berkeley High School senior Shakti Rajput hasn't been late for school once this year. By 7.45, I'm out the door. She wakes up early in a small apartment inside the motel her family owns and operates on University Avenue. You can come to school on time regardless of parents are together if you live five minutes away to an hour away. It's just that you have to put a little more effort into waking up. A student on time and in class every day means state dollars to spend on things like books and teachers. But not everyone shows up like Shakti. If kids aren't there, neither is the money. If you don't want to come to school class on time, you're not going to come. Yeah, you have to, you're, you have to motivate yourself to be to on time. Yeah. Yeah. On an average school day, over 6% of a 3,000 student body skip class or arrive late for school. Over one year, that adds up to over 50,000 missed class periods. And if you're habitually late for class, Class. This is Daniel Roos. You know Dean of Attendance, Daniel Roos. Well, first semester, I was late like, like three times. But it was a lot of class. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I, was, I was late. I was late like 20 times. Yeah, I went through my shoes. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> this year, Roos breaks with school discipline tradition and will give prizes to students like Shakti for perfect attendance and showing up on time. The idea behind these incentives is 
reach out to students who are coming to class, congratulate them and say, hey, you're doing the right thing, keep doing the right thing. Some people don't know how much work I'm putting on at home, how much I have to deal through. Shakti often spends her mornings helping with chores at the motel. And recently, she missed a week of school after her father became sick. If they're going to give incentives to the good kids, it's just going to make them feel happier. But once they go to college, they're not going to have any incentives. So how are they going to continue going to college classes um, without any incentive? That's not a magic bullet. That doesn't mean that all of a sudden a kid is going to start coming, but I think it's a really important step in saying there's an adult who cared, or at least at least there's an adult who noticed. For CNS News, I'm Jessica Najunas. I will trust. Coming up, Charles Berkowitz has the story of a bishop bringing his church back to life. Then Alan Sanchez reports on one woman's effort to memorialize the Mission District. But first, Pendarvis Harshaw has the story of two families bonded by loss and the search for justice. More than 13,000 YouTube viewers have seen it, the slaying of Kenneth Harding Jr., captured on amateur videotape. But the mother of the slain man, Danika Chapman, is not among them. I don't think any parent should have to witness how their child died. Yet Chapman knows enough about her son's death to feel a sense of injustice. I'm still looking for a ruling to hold these officers accountable for murder. Now, Chapman is turning to another family touched by police-related violence for help. The family of Oscar Grant has had their arms open to me openly and willingly from the time that I've touched down in California. Oscar Grant's uncle, Cephas, Uncle Bobby Johnson, has run a foundation focused on cases of police brutality since the murder of his nephew on New Year's Day, 2009. The foundation is titled the Oscar Grant Foundation. It represents support, support for those families that experience what we experience when it comes to the murder of a loved one by the state-sponsored police. The SFPD denies any accusations of murder in the Harding case, reporting that the bullet found in Harding isn't from the weapons officers used and matches a weapon found soon after the shooting, which they believe to be Harding's. Chapman is nonetheless suing the department, not for shooting her son, but for failing to assist him in time to possibly save his life. As Chapman awaits her day in court, Cephas Johnson is clear about what he wants to come out of this case. For people to see that these young men had family that loved them, and the effect that it has on the family, but most importantly, that these young men were human beings with love in their heart. For CNS News, this is Pendarvis Harshaw. I saw something on Facebook. I wasn't really sure what it was, and I thought that maybe the Roxy was closing. So I came over here to check it out. The Roxy isn't closing, but something was happening in the mission. Local artist Liz Worthy created an exhibit in the windows of the Little Roxy Cinema. She calls it a boutique, but it's really a nostalgic tribute to her changing neighborhood. The idea of making a fake boutique really appealed to me because it was just like, how much fun would that be? What kind of merchandise do you put in a boutique? <laughs> so I needed something that um, would continue to tie in with my idea of this boutique. Drawing on her own memories, Worthy made art out of merchandise once sold at stores that are now gone. At the corner of 18th and Valencia, is a, a jean store. You can buy really nice, fancy blue jeans called Self Edge there. And it's a really cool shop. It used to be um, leather tongue video. I thought, wouldn't it be funny if I made leather tongue blue jeans? Worthy created an exhibit that's reflective and humorous, making up prices that match store street addresses. It's good that people are making other people aware of like what used to be around. Because that's what pretty much like shaped everything. Eugene Hood, who grew up in the mission and now works at South Edge, says the recent real estate and tech booms has been a double-edged sword. Now it's like more of like like um, like high-rise lofts and like more like businesses opening up, like cafes and like crazy restaurants I never heard of. So, I mean, it could be a good thing, but same time, it's a bad thing for like people like me. You know. Rents are rising in the mission, and new businesses are opening up. But Worthy worries about the future. What happens when um, the bubble breaks again? 
and um, these places can't afford to stay in business. What are you left with? You're left with a bunch of kind of burnt trees and closed up storefronts. Worthy argues for stronger city policy that would protect the mission that has motivated her art. I think that there's a lot of city policy helping developers come in and develop the mission, and I think there could also be policy put in place to make sure that these places that we really love and consider part of our community stay as well. For CNS News, this is Alan Sanchez. For 25 years, Bishop J. E. Watkins Ministry has brought hope to the soul of West Oakland. But as Watkins and his parishioners recently discovered, nothing in today's post-mortgage meltdown world is sacred, not even a church. In the name of Jesus. Last October, Watkins received notice that Citigroup was foreclosing on his church. We're losing a piece of black history here. That was the clarion call. Save the Marcus Garvey building. And as you can the 145-year-old building, building, also known as Liberty Hall, has been a butcher shop, an infirmary, and home to black nationalist Marcus Garvey. It has the same historic landmark status as the White House. Today, Liberty Hall is also home to Watkins Overcomers with Hope Foundation, which helps train teenagers how to produce television programs. This is a legacy of community activism. This is kind of what we should be doing as a community. When you talk about like Marcus Garvey or any other community activism, it's for everyone. It's not about a black or white thing, it's a human thing. His congregation prayed and an angel investor came to their rescue. Jeff Creer, a realtor who owned shares in Citigroup, was so impressed with Liberty Hall, he decided to buy the building. He says, let's meet in the church. Let's go sit in the church. Let's sit in the studio. And he just kept talking about, this is a jewel, and nobody knows about it. It's a miracle in, in any way, shape, or form just to say, okay, we put out a signal, we had faith, and, and now the signal's coming back in a positive way. Church is not a building. The church is a body of baptized believers in Christ Jesus. That's what a church is. But the building keeps the rain off of you. For CNS News, this is Charles Berkowitz. Up next, Justin Pye explores a possible downside of an eco-friendly ordinance. But we start in a doctor's office, where Sean Havey reports on one man's struggle to afford life-saving treatment. Last year, Kenya Wheeler was a graduate student at Berkeley when he was diagnosed with brain cancer. As the mounting cost of his treatment approached UC's insurance ceiling, Wheeler faced being uninsured. Doctor will be in shortly. These students outside the Tang Center are protesting what they call UC's inadequate health care coverage. Less affordable and it has lifetime and annual prescription drug caps here at UC Ship. Every semester, UC students combine to the student health care plan called CHIP, but coverage disappears if a student's costs exceed $400,000. Okay. Yeah? Um, all right. You made it through all the tests that I had you. Made it through all the okay, tests. Okay, good. I mean, probably the, the 24 hour test is like the most. Yeah. After surgeons removed a large tumor in his brain, Kenya faced expensive and life threatening chemo treatment. Kenya and his longtime girlfriend Ruby decided to marry early. He is now covered by her insurance plan. Facing those kind of odds and dire insurance and, and potential dire health outcomes, um, you know, uh, Ruby and I had talked and like kind of decided to uh, um, you know, get married uh, earlier than we had planned. The first day I went to uh, UCSF for my uh, final hospital treatment, uh, Ruby and I got married at the UCSF Meditation Center and um, right hours before I started my, uh, my hospital stay. Kenya and others are finding support in Sacramento from Assemblyman Richard Pan. As a physician, I know that medical and hospital bills can exceed the UC lifetime cap of 400000 when you have a serious illness like cancer or some other chronic condition. Pan says UC insurance caps are out of step with the spirit of Obamacare that intended to do away with such caps. He recently announced plans to introduce legislation to ban them for UC students. The University of California should provide our students the same health care benefits and protections that, that's given to other Californians in the Affordable Care Act. The UC President's Office says it hopes to do away with caps on students' self-funded health insurance, but there may be a price to pay. We want to lift the lifetime caps, but we have to, I mean, we have a desire to at least explore it. 
Um, and what we're doing is actually trying to calculate how much will that increase the premiums to the students. Really, cost is not the issue here. It's, a, it's an issue of fundamentally making sure that your students don't get sick and die, which is pretty much bottom line of what a school should be doing. Wheeler, who still goes for regular checkups, is in complete remission and back at Berkeley. The university says very few students actually reach the cap. Nevertheless, UC is considering how to modify the plan so students like Wheeler won't lose their insurance when they need it most. If UC can get rid of caps for UC staff and can remove caps for UC faculty members and for the UC, UC president, UC students should have that same right extended to them. This is Sean Havey reporting for CNS News. These foods look innocent enough, but it's what happens to them when they leave the store that could surprise those who supported the ban on plastic bags. I like the fact that that there's less plastic being produced um, and less, less plastic ending up in the landfills and that people are being charged for paper bags because, you know, that's a little piece of a tree that you're using there. That may sound like the green thing to say and do, but it may not be the best thing for you unless you take some precautions. Anywhere you look, you can find bacteria. So I was not surprised at all they find a bacteria in shopping bags. Since San Francisco banned plastic bags in 2007, emergency room visits with E. coli diagnoses are up 34 percent. If you don't cook your food or it gets on your hand and you eat with your hand, then you can ingest those bacteria directly and then you can get sick. Studies are showing that 51 percent of reusable bags randomly tested in Arizona and California contained harmful bacteria. And when meat was added to those bags and left in a car for two hours, the bacteria multiplied tenfold. Washing your reusable bags seems to be a solution. It's said to eliminate 99.9% .9 of bacteria. I never wash my reusable bag. I don't worry about it much. So despite the evidence and the warnings, some people aren't buying it. I think it's silly. I think people would just like to make issues out of some things. Everything has to be an issue, even a good thing. And you think the reusable bags are a good thing? Yeah. Whether you pay for paper bags or bring your own, Dr. Lou has a tip. Use common sense and try not to cross-contaminate the food, and you can be safe with any type of bags. For CNS News, I'm Justin Pai. Coming up, Yusir Alhilu reports on students breaking athletic barriers. And finally, they're national champions, but most people have never even heard of the sport they play. Avni Najawan rolls out that story. But first, we take you to Oakland Tech, where Ashley Griffin explores how a decision to drop wrestling from the Olympics may affect young players who'd hope to go for the gold. They meet twice a week, all year long, and compete all over the country for the sport they love. <laughs> but recently, these young athletes from Oakland's Watu Rosari Wrestling Club learned that wrestling would be dropped from the 2020 Olympics. It's a sport that's been there for so long, and everyone loves it. And they said that it was like a sport that wasn't like view, viewed as much. All the sports are viewed. We all love all the sports. The International Olympic Committee gave no explanation why it dropped the sport, but some have speculated wrestling has lost its popularity and brings in less advertising dollars than other sports. For Oakland teens, wrestling has been a ticket to college, not to the Olympics since the 1960s. For many, that's still the gold. My main stream was like set on wrestling in the high school and then the college, and I was like, that's my, that's where I want to go from now. Like, I don't, I don't, I wasn't really worried about going to the Olympics. It was never really my main goal to go to the Olympics. I just want to better myself in it. But it, it, it does like ruin a lot of people's hopes and dreams getting in the Olympics. All the way up. All the way up. Coach Ashley Sherman says wrestling teaches more than going for the gold. Yeah, yeah. Right. They learn self-discipline. They learn self-esteem, and they learn to uh, deal with themselves and dealing with other people. 
and they also learn that there are other places outside of Oakland. To be reinstated, wrestling has to compete with a long list of other sports, hoping to make it back to the Olympic Games. There is a chance the IOC could reverse its decision when it meets in May to consider adding one more sport to the Summer Games. But for now, wrestling's out the competition. For CNS News, I'm Ashley Griffin. Anna Pickett was born without hands. But with family support and fierce determination, the high school senior has been playing soccer for more than a decade. I got on to pretty much every team that I tried out for. Actually, every team I tried out for. Um, if it's me against a girl, she will not get the ball unless I say so. But her success and athleticism are unique. Good job, Steph. A grim report from the U.S. Department of Education finds that schools rarely provide equal opportunities for athletes with special needs. It often means students like Anna have to make it on their own. If you try really hard to help somebody with disabilities um, and they say, don't treat me differently, that could be a response, or you don't treat them differently, and then they're like, why aren't you giving me accommodations? Her coach, J.T. Hanley, says it's up to every athlete, disabled or not, to develop the mindset to compete. On the move! You either focus in on poor me, and you say, oh, I can't do this or I can't do that, or you say, okay, what can I do? And then I'll do that to the very best of my ability. In Berkeley, these athletes bring a can-do attitude to the court, with custom wheelchairs designed for speed and agility. Let's just let your chair carry you. No, don't stop. Trooper Johnson, a four-time Paralympian, coaches Northern California's only competitive wheelchair basketball team. He says schools underestimate the value of sports for every student. You know, we don't want the schools feeling that they have to recreate the wheel, but I think that, that we don't want them leaving any of the, ki the kids out. These kids um, need this just as much as anybody, if not more. You know, that same desire exists whether they're in a wheelchair or whether they're in an able body. The captain of the team is James Bennett. He's a double amputee, but that doesn't slow him down. Able-bodied basketball, soccer, baseball, a lot of those sports really can't accommodate for people that are disabled very easily, um, which is why I'm very fond of these types of programs where people that are disabled can be a part of it and unite together essentially to make up their own program. Two colleges have already offered James scholarships to play at the next level. Anna is unsure where her athletic career is going, but she treasures the years she's already spent in soccer. I was dealt a difficult hand in life, ironically, um, and I've been able to persevere through it. Two athletes, two stories, one lesson in the importance of offering every student a chance to prove what it means to be an athlete. For CNS News, I'm Yusser al -Hari. When you first get on a unicycle, no matter who you are, it's going to feel impossible. I know, I know. I'm just trying to focus here. Jim Sowers is co-founder of the Berkeley Revolution unicycle basketball team, national champions of a sport that some associate more with, well, the circus than with serious competition. Just generally, when somebody sees you on a unicycle, they do the doot, 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 doot. I've gotten used to that. But that hasn't stopped people like Jim. It's actually encouraged them. And we said, this is the one time that we could be a world champion at something. The first championship we went to, we got second. I want people to realize that unicyclists are athletes. It's like Pilates Plus, because not only are you riding a unicycle, but you're constantly switching directions, and so you're using your core to do that. And not just anyone plays unibeeball. Unicyclists uh, tend to be a bit nerdy, um, depending, but they, they tend to be like technology people that do unicycling. And it, and it is something that you basically master on your own, and you have to be persistent. And Jim isn't just persistent on the court. A corporate lawyer and consultant for tech companies, a DJ, a salsa instructor, and a globe-trotting motorcyclist. 
Jim may be as unique as the one-wheeled sport he plays. You're constantly accelerating the wheel under you as you fall forward. So I really enjoy teaching beginners because once you open the door of a world that people want to go into but they thought was inaccessible, they, well, they never forget you as a teacher, <laughs> which is nice. Yeah, good. Oh my God, that's really good. Are you sure this is your first time? For CNS News, this is Avni Nachawin.